Good Mayo, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to speak about a subject I love, because this is something which I'm very passionate about, and it's a joy to speak to an audience like you about this subject, because I don't get many opportunities, nor will I in my life, to speak about the entirety of Manx Dialects Theatre, which will take about three or four hours. I think that's the agreed time limit for this evening. The, the, the doors are locked, you're not getting out. <laughs> but seriously, a part of why I like this subject so much is that Manx Dialect Theatre is partly about nation building. It's about creating anchors for our Celtic soul, as T.E. Brown would have had it. And in grasping this, we see that these plays are not outdated, silly entertainments. They're, in fact, things which were created to be the most Manx form of entertainment possible. But to explain that, we first need to talk about this lady. And I should say that there's going to be lots of um, photo quizzes throughout this evening. And I, and I will not move on until someone has a guess. <laughs> Who would like to hazard a guess? That's a rubbish response. <laughs> it's Sophia Morrison. Oh, you say yeah now. You should have said it before. And we normally see her like this. This was her favorite picture. But normally at the period at which she's doing her good work for Manx culture, she looks like the lady on the right here. This was taken in 1904. And most stories of Manx cultural history begin with her, for good reason. And normally the stories um, concentrate on her work for the language or folklore or music, and it's a joy to just concentrate on what she did for theatre tonight. Because if anyone can be attributed with creating Manx dialect theatre, it's Sophia Morrison, which I hope will be surprising to hear. And I'll explain why. Um, she was born into an affluent Peel merchant family in 1859, and she became involved in the cause, as she called it, the cause of everything Manx, in 1899, when the Manx Language, Soci Manx Language Society in Cheshire Gilgach was set up. And perhaps, obviously, with the Manx Language Society, it was created to try and stem the tide against the waning of Manx language speakers at that time. However, at their first AGM, their president, A.W. Moore, said something very interesting. He said that the society should not be confined merely to language, but should extend its energies to anything which leads to the preservation of everything that is distinctly Manx, and above all, to the cultivation of the national spirit, which I think is a pretty good aim. And with Sophia Morrison as their secretary, they had the right person in the job. And so what she did, first off, well, what you immediately they had Manx language lessons going on to teach the language, but at a time when people were ashamed to speak the language, what you also need is a setting where the language is put center stage proudly in a position to be celebrated. And so Morrison turned to the eel veries. And this was the traditional eel very back then. Uh, Christmas Eve, carol service, led entirely in Manx. And the first one which Morrison ran was in this church, which hopefully you can see. You might not recognize it in this picture, but I hope you will in this one. And in 1903, this was the picture of the inside for that first eel very, which is quite a magical picture, I think. And it was an enormous success. It was a success beyond measure, they say. And there's a good reason for having these extra chairs out, because on the night they had to turn people away. It was so popular. And it was a success again the next year. But then the year after, Morrison turned away from this form of eel very because it wasn't delivering on the national spirit she wanted. And so, in 1905, she established a new eel very tradition. You know where this one's going. She shifted it to the old Christmas Eve, so 11 days later, 
at the start of January. And instead of a church service celebrating the birth of Christ, it was an evening celebrating all aspects of Manx culture. An evening very like we all know from this stage. Um, there are readings of T.E. Brown, songs in Manx and English, dance, Manx language readings, and theatre in the form of the white boys. It was, in effect, Manxness in all of its many facets presented on stage for people to feel a part of, feel inspired by, and to celebrate who they are through what was going on. And of course, language was a part of it, but it was a lot broader than this. It was a lot broader idea of what it is to be Manx and what makes us Manx. And this all happened in the Albert Hall. And the Albert Hall was at the meeting of Stanley Road and the Promenade in Peel, where the, um, where the Empire Garage is today. And before I zoom in, hopefully you can see the sheets out drying on the brew behind, which I rather like. But there is the Albert Hall. And by 1907, an important step was taken forward with the introduction of a kitchen. Now, it might not sound that exciting, but wait till you see this. <laughs> this is the picture of the kitchen inside the Albert Hall. And I feel like I need to point out the window on the right, which is perhaps the only thing which gives away that this is a set, not an actual kitchen. And it's quite clear that this is an absolute recreation of a traditional Manx kitchen with the cholach and the, you know, the china and the pots and pans, everything you could expect. And I think for me, this speaks so much about where, how Morrison stands towards Manxness. Because if you're gonna do something Manx, do it very well. She was always setting the bar this high. Now, and it was, and indeed, the lady on the right there is Sophia Morrison on the stage. Not many people, if anyone, have seen these pictures knowingly who they are for a long, long time, I imagine. And there she is at the spinning wheel on the stage. And Morrison had, in effect, oh, at this time, the, the stage was just a setting for a Manx entertainment. But of course, as we can see, she had created a stage for a Manx drama which had yet to be written. And enter this lady. This is Josephine Kermode. Kushig. We normally see her in this form, which is perhaps obviously much younger than how she was at this time. This is probably a truer image of what she was. She was seven years Morrison's senior. She was born in Parliament Street, Ramsey in 1852. She was the daughter of a vicar. And so she moved with the family from St. Paul's, to Mackold and then Balaf before settling into adult life in Glen Alden. And since childhood, she'd been writing poetry under the nom de plume Cushig. And by 1907, with the publication of her first book, she was being hailed as the greatest poet the Isle of Man had ever seen since T.E. Brown. And in this collection, there is a poem which I imagine everyone will know. And we have here a reading from someone who was an actor in one of Cushig's plays. On the left here, Charles Watterson, talking to Ned Madrill. Um, this is a recording from the 1948 um, Irish Folklore Commission recordings. There are wicked little flirt that goes among us here. And the wickedness that Adam is telling far and near is Prowling and haggard and in at every door and coaxing and persuading and his name is Tre the Lua. The fields is full of cushions and the gates is patched with gorse. You can hardly see the harness for the mire up on the horse. And the cows are shouting shocking and puzzling for sure is the waiting doing on them at that cage is Tre the Lua. The the house is all through all us. The children's late for school. The men spending most a day and looking for a tool. And the woman's tired tremendous for cleaning up the floor. 
and the one that's doing all the jeal is that tedious trade that you are. We have a power of force within us, and enemies without, but the one that's doing most the jeal is that dirty, lazy lout. So just you take and scotch him, and put him to the door, and never let him in again, that tedious trade that you are. Isn't that wonderful? Um, uh, excellent restraint, everyone, by not joining in with that one. Um, as you might have guessed from his name being a Watterson, he's a southern one from Castletown. And I don't, admittedly, I don't go to Castletown very often, but I, I believe that they don't speak like this so much these days. And I think it's quite a nice reminder that accents change over time, even Manx ones. And it is interesting to imagine Cushig's plays being ac acted with this accent. And even in our own memory, the, the accents we think as the true Manx ones don't sound like this. And it's perhaps worthwhile remembering this when each new generation of heroes take up the Manx dialect performances. Now, of course, with poems like that one, Cushig did not avoid the attention of Morrison. And so Morrison soon set her to work, because it's around about this time that Morrison had seen the Irish plays of W.B. Yeats and Lady Gregory, and she was immensely impressed by their simplicity and naturalness. And she immediately started thinking of ways that she could use this in the Isle of Man. And we, she wrote a letter to her friend J.J. Neen saying, when writing to Miss Kermode, I told her about these plays and asked her to help me in a future Manx concert by writing something on the same line as we are badly off for some genuine Manx items. After some correspondence, the following idea for a children's playlet has evolved and Miss Kay is now writing it out. And this was the first Manx dialect play, Them Old Times. Or oh, Rosie Basin, sorry. And the short play follows um, a family's preparations for going to bed. It's quite straightforward. They leave out the food and drink, and then they go upstairs, and eventually they leave out the food and drink for the fairies, I should say. And eventually they come in, and they dance and sing, and Matilda come down and join them before scuttling away when the parents call them. It's very simple, that's it. And indeed, one reviewer said that they had a feeling of disappointment at the meagerness of the plot and the abruptness with which it terminated. But it should really be understood as a performance not built around plot, but built around Manxness, I would say. Because the play features distinctively Manx singing, stories, dialect, dancing, substantial references to the Fenordery and the Mother Do, and it has the presence of Manx fairies on stage. And so it shouldn't well, it should be understood as an amalgamation of all those different things in a Manx concert mushed together into this one wonderful super Manx thing. And so it is not primarily a narrative, but a celebration of Manxness in all of its forms. And so the first ever performance of a Manx dialect play was in the Albert Hall on Thursday, the 23rd of April, 1908. And the first half of the evening was the normal concert with various things going on. And the second half was the play, which sounds like a pretty good format for an evening, if you ask me. Um, and we can get an idea of how uh, confident Morrison was with this and how um, serious she was with this new direction because she invited along the lieutenant governor who watched a private performance and then even posed for pictures on the stage. And there is Lord Raglan there with his family on the stage. Which I think is quite interesting to think of Manx Dialect Theatre in this sort of setting, bringing the great and good to little old Albert Hall in Peel. Now, the relative success of them old times um, was followed quickly by two more plays written by Cushig under the suggestion and close uh, supervision of Morrison. Yowness, or The Dolby Maid, and The Lazy Wife. 
but these are both quite far from what we'd recognize as Manx dialect theater today. One is an ethereal drama about the confrontation of English modernity and old world Manx ways. And the other is a fantastical romp through a tale invoking enslaved lil fellas and giants, all of them on stage. It's a marvelous thing, but they're just not quite on the mark to how we now understand Manx dialect theatre. And just out of interest, both of these were first produced at a bazaar in Peel in 1908, organized as a fundraiser for the spire on Peel Cathedral, which of course was put up in 1884, and then a storm showed structural damage, and so they had to take it down, and they tried to raise money to put it back up, but of course, it never happened. Um, Cushig was to go on to write other plays, such as the Glen Olden plays in 1916, but they weren't produced by Morrison, and by this time, the flow of Manx dialect theatre had moved on to other writers. Now, there isn't enough time to speak about everyone in here, sadly, and so I'm going to have to jump over W.B. Merrick, and this, by the way, is him in, in part. This is not actually how he dressed normally, I don't believe. <laughs> and I'm also going to have to jump over um, John Quine. Now, because their careers were quite short in Manx dialect theatre for fascinating and wonderfully interesting reasons, but I can't tell you because there isn't time. Um, however, we will pause briefly on jolly old John Quine. <laughs> um, <laughs> because in 1910, his play, Kitty's Affair, um, we have a recording of one of the actors in there as well, who I think is very interesting. He was later in the Peel Players, Tom Dodd, who was a bank manager in Peel. And again, it's the 1948 Irish folklore recordings. And I'll ask you to listen in to the voice with which he introduces this T.E. Brown. An extract uh, from Betsy Lee by T.E. Brown. Now the beauty of the thing when the children plays the terrible wonderful length the days is. Up your jumps and out in the sun and you fancy the day will never be done. When you're chasing the bombies hummings across in the hot sweet air among the goss, or gathering bluebells, or looking for eggs, or a pelting the ducks with their yellow legs, or a climbing and nearly breaking your skulls, or a shouting for devilment after the gulls. That's the way with the kids, you know, and the years do come, and the years do go, and when you look back, it's all like a puff, happy and over and short enough. And I think that's fascinating because maybe he was putting up his accent to introduce it, but still there's a large gap between his everyday voice and his dialect voice. And I think sometimes looking back, we imagine that everyone on the stage back then had these accents. But I think it's fascinating to realise that some of them were putting it on. And that's okay. If Tom Dodd did it, it's okay. Now, the next important playwright was this fella. This is Christopher Shimon, a 42-year-old 40, Peel Monumental Mason. And we have the Great Depression to thank for him being in the Isle of Man in the 1910s, because here he is on the right, this dashing young fella, in a photo taking, taken in Chicago where he had emigrated at the age of 21. But he timed it wrong, and he couldn't really find secure work. And so he came back towards the Isle of Man, got a job as a sailmaker on a boat, and then landed in Liverpool, where he was a sanitary inspector. And then finally, he made it back to Peel as a dashing young man with a fine moustache, where he became a monument, monumental mason. Later on, he became a Labour MHK, um, and involved in the great strike, of course, of 1919. But back in 1912, Sophia Morrison, 11 years his senior, met him and set him to work on two plays, Ilium Coderre's Will and The Charm. 
Now, most of you will know these plays and certainly the charm, I would hope. But perhaps you won't know that perhaps it shouldn't just be Shimon's name on the play. Because if you look in the Manx Museum, you can see what appear to be the original notes laying out the characters and the plot and what, how the play works. And this is not Christopher Shimon's handwriting. This is Sophia Morrison's handwriting. And of course, this was unacknowledged at the time. It's been entirely forgotten over the years. And so it's very lovely to be able to acknowledge it here. And I'm somewhat disappointed there wasn't an enormous gasp when I said that this was written by <laughs> Sophia Morrison. And um, as for Cushig years earlier, Morrison was heavily involved in the development of these plays, perhaps even mapping them out entirely and giving this to Shimin to write up into a performable script, which is really quite amazing. Now, after rehearsals in Morrison's own home in Athol Street, the two plays were first presented in November 1912, and unlike any other performance before, there was no supporting act. This was an event solely and confidently built around Manx Dialect Theatre. And I think that at this point, we should have another film. The Michael play is at last. Um, they're performing the charm. And as we know, there is um, a traveling woman who comes in and causes them to sleep. And with a herb, she um, switches the roles. And so instead of Jem being the tough taskmaster, it's the wife whose name escapes me momentarily, Kiri, who is the tough taskmaster. And this is when they awake and here we are. Oh, what better I do next? Where's the, where's the dishcloth? Here! <laughs> Easy woman, don't hurt the yeah, parents. Yeah, stupid girl, there'll be no plates left in the house. Easy woman, be as easy as you can. Too long I've been easy. I'll eat ya! I'll eat ya! Of all the books that a woman is tormented with, you're the worst. Eating, sleeping, and talking is all you're good for. Get your head in and get out of me sight, you big on. Lock himself in. Are you there, Jim? We best be going. You best be going home. And not wasting your time straving into these fairs. Go home and help your poor Darlene of a wife. And if you've got no farm work to do, you're another good for nothing. And what's the meaning of this? What are you doing there, Jem? Has herself gone out of her senses? Has she gone clicky? Clicky? How clicky, yay! Take your hands with you! And so here we are at Manx Dialect Theatre as we know and love it. This is, this is what it's all about, isn't it? Um, but I want to reflect on two things about this play, which I think are particularly interesting. Firstly, if you remember, Pai, the woman who's going around the houses, when, the, when Jem and Kiri are asleep, she has a long scene where she just talks about the stuff on the dresser. And if you're looking at this as a dramatic play, this scene is weird and boring, I guess. However, we should remember that, that stage of Sophia Morrison. A part of the play is its manxness, and the set itself is a key part of why you're watching this play. And so for me, this is a very clever scene which shows us that this play is not necessarily just about plot, it's also about the manxness, and you are learning partly how to be manx through this play. Secondly, the dialect Let's zoom in. This, by the way, is Christopher Shimon with the fine moustache and Sophia Morrison in the corner there. Um, secondly, the dialect used, even at that time, was somewhat archaic. And we know this from the Peel City Guardian, where it was reported that the dialogue was excellent, bringing in all the known Manx expressions, which were not so long ago generally used. 
And so as with Morrison's collecting elsewhere, her aim in these plays was the preservation of Manx dialect. But better than just writing it down in a book, which she did do, this was preserving it in use on a stage, which was, of course, much more useful and will keep the words alive much, much better. Now, this preservationist or nostalgic streak to the plays was built into it from the very off. They always were of this mode. They always were, in a sense, old-fashioned, but for a very good reason. And if you're just seeing it simply as old-fashioned, you're not reading the play correctly. Anyway, the seriousness of the production meant that Morrison was confident to take it to Douglas, to the Gaiety Theatre, no less. <laughs> now, you'd think that Douglas was kind of antithetical to the Manx Dialect Theatre mission, and in, in a sense it was. But how Morrison viewed it was, I believe, that if these things were to be taken seriously, then you need to put it on the serious stage as good as those English ones. And she did it. And so Morrison herself set about doing all the little jobs, including booking special trains and trams to get the performers and audience there. Um, she also booked in the restaurant for the meals. She designed the, the adverts. She printed the tickets and any number of these tiny little concerns which no one else thought of, but she'd already covered. And the evening was a fantastic success, with the Lieutenant Governor, many Deansters and the like, all the VIPs were there, to an event which had wonderful reviews for how well it went. And interestingly, this was the first appearance of their name, the Peel Players. And I, sus I well, I don't know if that when it first appeared in the newspapers, it was merely a description or whether it was a real name. But Morrison took it and ran with it, printed it big and large at the top of the uh, posters. Because this was not Douglas invading Peel, this was Peel invading Douglas. And it's worthwhile saying that the, mic the, sorry, the Peel players were not the first dialect players, nor the most prolific, nor the most long-lasting. But they're correctly recognized as highly, highly important because they guided in the golden age of Manx dialect theatre, in this sense, with Morrison at its helm. Now, yet again, as for Cushig, Morrison didn't just rest on her laurels. She began another enormously ambitious project to take dialect theatre even further. She organised a competition, and here's the advert for it. Big prizes for new Manx plays. Big cash prizes, no less. Because the prize for the Manx history play was standing to win 15 pounds. And the Manx comedy was going to win a further 10 pounds. And this was in 1913. This is an enormous amount of money. And so this garnered a lot of interest. They got 11 plays from eight anonymous authors one of whom was Sophia Morrison herself. And the best play was judged to be Christopher Shimmins Lus Negrai, which is here. However, it was too long. The word count was too long. And so the first prize went to A Little Smook by J.J. Neen. <laughs> and of course, as we all know, um, these two plays have gone on to become two of the most performed and most loved of all Manx dialect plays. And were it not for this competition, they wouldn't exist. And as one of the adjudicators, W.H. Gill, the author of the Manx National Anthem, said, these are things of beauty, joys forever, which I think is perfect. But as well as merely delivering some plays, it also raised the standard of how people saw Manx dialect theatre. A competition like this would have been unimaginable years before, and yet Morrison was taking it on this journey, up, upwards and onwards at an incredible rate. And then 1914 happened. And of course, with the start of the war, everything changed, and it became almost impossible for the Peel players. Indeed, it was with great difficulty 
that Lus Negri was produced. And it was only done because they had already committed to it before the war began. And this, again, is not a shop. This is a set. And I think it's, again, phenomenal that this is where Sophia Morrison's bar is. And it's, it, I would like to imagine that she'd done the kitchen, she'd achieved that, and now she's portraying Manx life going on out of the home in a shop. Who knows what would have been next? Um, because after this, that was it for Morrison. She had many further plans for Manx Dialect Theatre for when the war finished. New plays, new productions, new venues, new collaborators. But none of this was to happen because her health failed her and of course she died in 1917. And her coffin was carried to her grave by Christopher Shimmin and other actors from the Peel Players. And I think it's lovely that a couple of years earlier, Cushig said the perfect things about her. She has made us feel kinship with each other and by her appreciation and encouragement is gradually forming a national literature enriched with treasures of the past and full of promise for the future. Which are lovely sentiments. And if only she lived longer, who knows what would have happened. Now, of course, that wasn't the end of Dan Manx Dialect Theatre, as we know. And a name we've already mentioned is this fella. John Joseph Neen, J.J. Neen, um, the greatest Manx linguist of his day and one of the most important Manx scholars there's ever been. Um, his plays began to emerge, as we've already said, during Sophia Morrison's time, but he really kind of sprang out in the 1920s. He was born in Hanover Street in Douglas in 19, 1873, and he was a sweet manufacturer by trade. And I think people kind of forget this because he gave so much of his life and produced so much in Manx studies that we kind of forget that during the days he was making sweets. Um, and I'm sure many of you will have his place names of the Isle of Man on your shelves, wherein you'll find fascinating things about Kurt Michael. Um, and it was for books like this and his other ones for which he was awarded a knighthood from the King of Norway, for which, or at the same time as which, this picture was made of him. And he was said to be a very serious person which might be a surprise to anyone who's ever seen one of his plays, because his plays are riotously fun, as you can perhaps get an idea of with this slightly ridiculous uh, picture of the first production, Ghoul on the Cushigs, from 1912. And I believe that this is outside the Peel Methodist Chapel in Port Erin, but I stand to be corrected. Then after this one came a little smook, which we just heard about, and it had been Morrison's intention to stage it, but the war got in the way. And so it had to wait until Mona Douglas came back to the Isle of Man to stage it with the Balasala players in 1920. And it was on a double bill with Yaunas, the play by Cushig. And so this is the cast, I believe, which did um, a little smook. And if you look in close, the lady center back is Mona Douglas herself. And the fellow in the beard on the right is Charles Watterson again. <coughs> and you'll all know the plot of the play, I hope. Um, many of you will have been in it, and it was performed only in 2018. Margaret Qualtrough is done with her husband's constant smooking, and so she pretends that she's falling ill by it until he gives up. And then he believe, well, he realizes that he's been duped. And so he begins to pretend that he's losing his memory. And the play goes on to there. And we'll join it just as, she wa just as he wanders into the house. And they're working out what's gone wrong with him. Oh, Margaret, worse than that, far worse. <laughs> what could be worse than that? They're, surely they're having me go on and done some deal to yourself, broken the arm or the leg. How could I be walking with me legs broke, man? <laughs> Have a little bit of common sense, aren't they? <laughs> but it's worse than that, even. <laughs> worse than that? What could be worse than that? Surely they're having me gone and killed old Mother Creech. 
worse than that. <laughs> And this is probably one of the most performed of all Manx dialect plays, and for good reason. It's great. But actually, in terms of Neen's uh, writing, one of the most important plays for him is actually Puddin' Up the Bands. And this was first produced in 1924 in London, because this was the start of his relationship with the London Manx Society. And they first produced it in their home in the Bride Institute which is just off Fleet Street, within a stone's throw of uh, St. Paul's Chapel, um, which is wonderful to think of these plays first being produced here. And I think for a good reason, um, because the, Lon well, the London Manx Society went on to commission a series of important plays from Neen over the next eight years or so, and you'll recognise here some plays which have been glorious and riotously fun on the stage over the, over the past however many years. And without the London Manx Society, I imagine that these plays would not have been written. And you can well understand why the London Manx Society would, in, well, the Manx ones in the society would enjoy these plays so much. Because their joyful insider reveling and celebration in Manxness must have been spectacular to those good Manx ones living so far from home. And if we think of writers like T.E. Brown, who wrote all of his folksal yarns in Bristol, or writers like Kathleen Farragher or Mona Douglas or Hall Caine, all of whom began their Manx writings abroad, clearly this is something which people launch into. People launch into their Manxness when they are away and have that cause to try and leap back. And so you can easily understand why these Manx plays would have been so important in London perhaps, as opposed to they might have been here. And another collaboration important for Neen was with the Pert Iron Cushigs. They were founded by Lily Duggan, stood up there. Um, they were founded in the 1924. This was taken in the 1950s. But they were founded in the 1920s, and they went on to be the great champions of Neen's work here in the island. And they were the first ones to perform most of those plays we just saw in the island. And indeed, by the end of just the 1930s, they had produced Puddin' on the Bands as many as 50 times. And it's worth reflecting that, of course, Manx dialect theatre isn't really a literary tradition. You don't really pass on the plays through uh, books or written words. It's something which exists on the stage. And without bands of actors like the, like the Pert Ein Kushigs, then you just, the, the tradition won't exist. And so people like the Pert Ein Kushigs deserve a great mention for the enormous work they did to popularise and promote the work of Neen and others in those years. But by his death in 1938, J.J. Neen had written 13 plays, making him probably the most prolific Manx dialect playwright there's ever been. And it's delightful to know that his work is still being kept alive thanks to the Michael players. Now, the founder of the Pert Iron Cushigs, who I mentioned, Lily Duggan, I was looking for an image of her in the Eye Museum just the other week, and I was delighted to find this. She's making socks here from the First World War as you do. Um, I was going to use her recording of a poem to introduce the next writer, 
but then I remembered that the Culture Van in oral history recordings um, have an interview made by David Collister back in 2000 with this fella, Norman Barron, of course. Um, this is a longer extract because you can't possibly stop this poem halfway through. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. I've a hard tale about Bobby Bob and his woman Margaret Ann. She used to call him an awkward big slob in the butt of a slipper of his hand. And bless me soul, the push she'd make when he'd slay it with a sum on the southern cake. Bobby Bob, thou slob, she'd bawl. Well, Abba, was thou brought up at all? But Bobby would seldom answer it back, but ate away till his lips would smack. Thou be noisin' like muckin' when thou ate, and put thy skethin' down on thy plate. And Bobby would say that quiet and slow, I'm pullin' it down where there's man to go. Now, Bobby wasn't a bad soul at all, but mighty fond of a drop for all. <clears throat> but they're saying her constant nagging and frown sent Bobby to town as troubles to drown. And as then herself would be ever on his track to give him curd day when he'd get back. But that's where Margaret Falk got stuck because it was just like water on the wing of a duck. At last, she thought, I'll cure him, though. I'll give me old Bobby Bob what for. So the next time Bobby went to town, herself with a friggin' got prowling around and worked herself all up into a pidge. Then off she goes for the Doric Bridge just to wait for Bobby to come, saying, I'll cure the old rascal of rum. But Margaret hadn't to wait that long, for yonder was Bobby coming strong for the narrow bridge, tacking his way like a heavy ship in a heavy sea. Oh, frecken the marvelous witch, she said, and then flung a sheet right over her head and rushed to meet him with a scream just as Bobby was crossing the stream. <laughs> I've come to claim thee, Bobby Cow. Come thou with me. For I'm the jowl. Oh, deed thou, says Bobby, as he blinks and leers. Well, give me your hand. Frecken, no fears, for I've lived with thy sister for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that poem is... Oh, come on. <laughs> Old Bobby Bob by Jew and Noah, of course. Jew and Noah, whose real name was John Cleeter. Now, I don't know if any of you will have seen a picture of John Cleeter, but there he is at the back. Many of you might recognize Leighton Stowell looking stately in the front. He, of course, is very important for Manx dance, but he was also very important in Manx dialect recitations and performances back then. And this is a team from Ramsey off to perform one of Noah's plays in Liverpool. And in fact, if you look up in the Eye Museum, you can find uh, reports of evenings where there's Manx dancing and then recitations and plays with Leighton Stoll, Jew and Noah and Kathleen Farragher, all on the same bill. And if I was a time traveller, I know where I would be going. <laughs> um, Cleeter was a draper in Ramsey, his shop was in Parliament Street, and he was also a commissioner for a time. But he was best known for his, well, today he's best known for his marvelous book, Manx Yarns, a book of poems. And that came out in 1930. And that was the same year in which he won at Nkhunyacht for the play, The Reformer. And this, was enormously popular at the time. So this was first produced in 1930, and in 1937, or oh, in 38, it was described like this. Excuse me. The Reformer is perhaps the best known and one of the most popular of all Manx plays. And the plot is quite straightforward. Um, this is in the 50s, some years later, Leighton Stowell is here in a beard, and there's Jew and Noah 
stately on the other side. The plot of the play is Esther is being forced by her father to marry the rich neighbour. There he is sat down, stuffing his pipe or whatever he's doing. But happily for Esther, her sweetheart, Dewin, there he is in the back, returns from Africa and he um, tricks the father into admitting that he has been stealing sheep. And it's this information which allows Dewin to get the father's um, consent to marry his daughter. And the happy end is there. Um, the play is excellent. It's one of the best plays I know. And as the, as the quote shows, it was one of the plays, or in fact, the play of the 1930s. However, sadly, it contains descriptions of Africans, which I imagine would have been quite shocking even in the day. And um, the key scene of the whole play is where Dewin blacks up and impersonates a tribal dance and is mistaken for the devil. And so it's for this good reason that we don't see it on the stage these days and it's been quietly forgotten. But it's a great shame that his other plays, safely in Manx territory, um, it's a shame that these other plays were overshadowed during his lifetime by the reformer. And so these ones never quite emerged to establish themselves on the scene, even though they are excellent plays. And so hopefully someone like the Michael Players or another group might bring us Jew and Noah on the stage again. Now, the second half of the 1930s, there was a bit of a lull in the plays being produced. And we can get a hint of this by the introduction of the Kizik Trophy to the Guild in 1938. And when Mr. and Mrs. P.D. Kizik presented it, the papers noted that it is not so much an increase in the number of dialect plays entered that is required, but a decided improvement in the quality of our native drama. It gets worse. If the Kizik Trophy can bring this about, it will be doing a worthy service for the amateur movement in the island. The position of Manx plays in the local drama contest has long been a bone of contention. There can be little doubt that the great majority of Manx dialect plays are little more than trivial sketches, lacking most, if not all, of all the fundamental points which constitute dramatic endeavour, for which marks are or should be awarded at the Guild. And I'll ask you to remember Pai and her um, description of what's on the shelves, because clearly there's a clash of ideologies of what a play should be. And Manx Dialect Theatre doesn't really have a home on the gaiety stage with English adjudicators telling them how to act. And I think this is a nice reminder of that. But all the same, there was, I think, it is fair to say there was a lull in the plays in the late 30s. And we had to wait until the start of the 1950s to see a revival of the quality of the plays. And I'd be delighted if you surprised me by shouting at a name. This, of course, is Eva Neen, who I imagine many of you will know the name of, but perhaps have never seen. And she, along with her sister Lillian, um, became the most prolific Manx playwrights of the 1950s. She was born in Douglas, uh, the daughter of the preacher at the Bethel, and eventually she went through school and got a degree from Liverpool University before going on to be a teacher in Birkenhead, eventually becoming the head teacher at Conway Street Secondary School for Girls in 1954, says my Googling. <laughs> and this was in Birkenhead. And in Birkenhead operated the Merseyside Manx Society. And of course, it was through this society that the Neen sisters began to indulge themselves or celebrate their Manxness on the stage. I believe that this is Mr. Quilliam Decides, I think. And they were soon acting in, in plays. These are the two sisters on stage. They were soon acting in plays, and soon enough, they were writing them. And Ava was, or Eva was the first one, I think, to start experimenting with the duologue, a short uh, comic play normally with just two actors. And this is a format taken further later on by Kathleen Farrago and others. But two great plays by Eva Neen in this format is A Trip on a Double Decker and The Queen's Visit to the Isle of Man. 
but the Neen sisters also wrote full-scale Manx dialect plays like The Dumb Cake, which I hope everyone will know. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is Burke Quayle, Anne Corlett, and Norman, Norman Barron, of course, there. And another play, of course, was Mr. Quilliam Decides, performed only this year by the Michael Players. And these plays, written by performers for specifically celebratory Manx events, are really hitting the right mark, as you will see from this video from Brian. Thank you much for this one. Enjoy. The sounds of it funny to begin with, so bear with. Well, I suppose I'd better go to work. It seems to be expected of me. There doesn't seem to be no other way out. Mr. Quilliam, you big toot. I'm ashamed of you. You mean to say you'd marry a woman just because the gossip's expected? Call yourself a man? Oh, yeah. well, there's more rabbit pie for you then! <laughs> <laughs> easy on, easy on, woman. And no offense, man. How may the understanding of me at all? Now, how long have I waited a bit, man? Believe me, I'm just gonna have to help you. That's dead. This. I haven't asked Isabella yet. And as thou the only one that's left on the list, you'll be the only one for me. Oh, no, you don't! <laughs> 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 you not tell me one left, and I haven't said no yet, as I know so. Huh. And how dare you, Queenie? I was number three on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe his man is to wait till he's been axed. And I know Mr. Quilly hasn't axed you yet. I never have done that I know of. Oh, hasn't he, though? Huh. Just as shy he says he is. Well, he'll have a job to explain this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lady, lady, lady. This is no, there's no cause for this, all this. But I would have to. Hey, listen. My <laughs> <laughs> friend, you are too running in here with rabbit pie as soon as me back is turned. Yeah, big skid. <laughs> you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And who do you think you are to talk like that, you big? <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian, for recording that. That's a joy. Um, 1997, if the VHS is to be trusted there. Um, the last play I can find from the Neen sisters was Up for the Guild from 1954. And then the second half of the 1950s, I think, was the era of the most exciting Manx playwright there ever was, I would be tempted to say. J.E.Q. Cool, John or Jack Cool. He was born and raised in Peel. He was a saddler on Tin Rule Road and he got involved in theatre almost by mistake, first as a stage manager for the Pro Tem Players at Centenary Hall, and then falling into producing the annual Panto with the Peel Youth Centre. But by 1957, this had led to him writing his first Manx dialect play, The Gain Belt, uh, what? The Gain Bait, which was premiered at the annual Bachelor's Tea and Concert at the Methodist Hall in Bride, where it was apparently the old time custom that the unattached eligible males of the parish dressed themselves up in an apron and cap and served the ladies with an excellent supper. <laughs> Probably a good idea if the uh, Michael Harris Trust are looking for anything. <laughs> but regardless, the play shows all the ha hallmarks of Cool's work. It's, they are perfectly formed plays stocked full of brilliant Manx jokes, flowing naturally into something both dramatically pleasing and hilarious. And here is just a snippet of it from 1997. Enjoy. And surely, of course, can't do damage like that. Oh, but he does, though. And she's tried setting all kinds of traps. No, look. And what kind of trap do you set for a ghost? Well, she set a gin trap. 
But he sucked off all the gin. <laughs> and he took off when I was flying away. And I was telling her that maybe she should go see that woman that's catching all the rabbits around here. Mrs. Um, uh, Mrs. Matosis, I think that. <laughs> oh, yes, I think I know what you mean. <coughs> Why doesn't your sister try exercising it? Exercise? Lord, how would you get enough exercise? Why are you throwing it out? He's keeping them awake every night. Oh, dear me, it must be awful trying. Oh. What? That's me, what's that thing? Trying to come over the head. It's a big egg, you shiver. Oh, dear, what shall I do? Even Master Welfare. That's a fine evening. Isn't that me, wife? <laughs> Jack Cool also wrote Buying Balabagan and In the Doctor's Waiting Room. But these had to wait to be performed posthumously because in October 1959, he went for what appears to be a relatively straightforward operation at Broad Green Hospital in Liverpool, and then he never awoke, and he was only 36. And less than a year before that, He'd married a young teacher from Albert Road School named Edna Norton of Kurt Michael. And it was within two months after his death that their daughter was born, Rosemary. And it was Rosemary Cool who very kindly gave me this picture of her mother, aged 90, in 2009. And I imagine one, of you, one or two of you might enjoy seeing her here. And of course, this leads us back to the center of the Manx dialect world, Kurt Michael. And the Kurt Michael, or the Michael players, RBV. It's hard, well, we, I don't think we know when the Michael players were first formed, but they, Manx dialect plays were beginning to be performed in the 1930s. And then the first uh, revived performance came in 1954, where Miss Mary Cannell organized an event for the visiting Celtic Congress people. And then Miss Cannell and Edna Cool produced the Michael players, of course, for decades. And I would say that the key thing which made them so successful was how they involved the whole community. It wasn't a thing about those actors up on stage. Whether you liked it or not, it was about the whole community. And this was so unlike the other groups out there, and this is why Michael survived so strong when others were faltering. And this is how the collection of plays grew as it did over the years. Because as other groups were stumbling and falling, Michael remained strong. And so these plays made their way here. And of course, as we said, this is not a literary tradition. These are not things which are necessarily printed. These are things which exist only in a few performers' um, copies. And if they had not made it here to Michael, these plays almost certainly would not exist. And that is why the Michael Players collection, with its 50 and more plays, is probably the most important collection of Manx dialect theatre in the world. And so, hopefully, this has kind of explained how or how and why this is all so important here in Michael. Because we began with Sophia Morrison capturing the past and celebrating all things Manx. And we followed through some of the key authors and groups going on a journey through Port Erin, London, Birkenhead, and all the way to Kurt Michael. And here, I think, two of the most important things have happened. One of which is the saving of these incredibly important part of our cultural history, these plays. And also, just as importantly, the continuation of these performance of these plays, which date back over a hundred years and which were created as the most Manx of all things. And so thank you and long may it continue. Thank you.